right, you guys did way better with me than you did a minute ago, so that's good. All right. If you have a Bible, let's turn to John chapter 20. If you don't have a Bible, there's probably one of the chairs in front of you, uh, unless you're been put in a front row, and then I hope you just have a Bible. Let's go with that, all right? Uh, as you're turning there, I was just looking at this verse. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, For the dead are not, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. He goes on to say that if that is not true, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain. That means that what we talk about today, if, if Jesus remained in the grave, then our message today is a waste of time, and you could have slept in. And so we left off here on Friday night with, we discussed the crucifixion and the betrayal of Jesus and the beating and crucifying of Jesus, as Jesus willingly gives his life in our place. And what we did is we looked at snapshots of the people around Jesus during that move from the garden all the way to the cross, and eventually we left off in the tomb. And so today I want to do something similar as we look at the story of the resurrection. Now, it's probably a very familiar story. Maybe you've never been in church before. That's okay. We're going to cover the whole story. But if you've heard it, and if you've heard it before, then I just want to ask you the same question we asked on Friday night. Like, where do you find yourself in the story? And, and sometimes the message of the cross and the crucifixion and resurrection, sometimes that, that story is confusing. Sometimes that story is it's not easy to track with. And I find that the, that the people in Scripture, that they're the real people, we're just, we have the narrative of what they went through and what they said and what they did, and sometimes we find ourselves in them. And it helps us to understand ourselves in light of them. If you, have a, if you borrowed a Bible, just, I'll give you the cheat. It's on page 906, just in case you guys are looking, all right? While you're doing that, let me put kind of a main idea on the screen Believing in a living Jesus. So really my question for you today is, what do you believe today about Jesus being alive? People's responses who experience the resurrection firsthand help us understand our own responses, right? So the, the question is, what do you believe about Jesus today, about the claim that Jesus is alive today? In fact, even sometimes we talk about a resurrection, we talk about someone who rose from the dead, but we miss that that means still alive and alive forever. And so the gospel message is very simple. It's about a God who loves you. In fact, if you are new to the church or new to the message of Christ, it begins with a God who loves you. So if you've never heard that before, let me tell you this again, God loves you. And that God designed you, created you. You're not a random chance or accident. That just as everything we have, from this Bible to the iPad to the shoes I put on, have a creator, a maker, so do you. So do I. And then that creator desires a relationship with his creation. And then that's us. And just as when we create something, we give a purpose to it, we know how it's made, right? There's absolutely a difference between a minivan and the Jeep I drive. I don't just mean that my Jeep's cooler. I, I mean that there's a purpose, right? You got lots of kids. You may want a Jeep, but you may need a minivan, right? And if you try and minivan some of the places I go, you will not have a minivan for very long. I know, we see them out there in the desert. <laughs> so you have a purpose you're created for. Your design is that you would be in relationship with your creator. That's the idea but that we have all turned and pushed God away, that we have chosen to go our own direction, that we have chosen to disobey God, maybe willing, maybe unwilling, maybe knowing, maybe unknowing. And I will tell you this, especially if you're a guest here today, those of us that call this church home will let you know for sure we are imperfect, we are flawed, we fail all the time. We're pretty honest about that that we fall short of what God has called us to. And because of that, that sin that separates us, it's like infidelity in a marriage that separates a relationship, that, it, that sin separates us from God. And so we begin in a place of separation. 
And it's something that we cannot work towards or achieve on our own. And since we could not do it, God came to us. And so Jesus became flesh. The Son of God became man. And entered into human history and flesh and bones and blood. And, and he came in and he lived the life that you and I are called to live, but have failed, who choose, we choose not to. And then he died a death in our place to pay the penalty of our sin. And we left off on Friday night seeing Jesus crucified, him hanging on a cross. The image is there that between a holy God and a sinful humanity hangs Jesus. And as he dies, he says these words, it is finished. The payment for sin, the penalties for sin, the, the work necessary to reunite a holy God with a sinful and wayward humanity is complete. He says it is finished, and he gives his life. And we closed our service as Jesus is laid in a tomb. And we heard those words from the famous preacher, uh, actually from San Diego, S.M. Lockridge, many years ago. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And we know that there is hope in Sunday, and so that's where we are. We're, we're in the in-between as we pick up in the story. And so John chapter 20, starting in verse 1, says this. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So this is where we leave off. It's now the first day of the week. It's three days later. Jesus has been buried. There's a stone covering the entrance to the tomb. It's been guarded. And there are those who have cared for the body. And again, a different setting than today, right? The embalmment process is different than what they would do. And, and so they would care for the body. So you would go and care for your loved one. And Mary, who was a woman who was healed by Jesus and is, and, and is fond of Jesus and been around Jesus as a friend of Jesus, has been caring for the body and goes back and the the stone is rolled away and the tomb is empty. And she doesn't know what to do with this. And so verse 2, it says, She ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that's John, our author, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Verse 3, So Peter went out with the other disciples, so Peter and John take off. It says, And they were going toward the tomb. Verse 4, Both of them were running together, but the other disciple, meaning John, our author, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I think they have a competitive spirit. It says, we took off together and we ran together, but I beat him there. I love that. There you go. And so they leave hearing, hey, somebody's taken the body of Jesus. And, and this is this is disheartening for them, at least. And this is someone they've loved and followed. And John and Peter especially have been close to. John stood beside his, Jesus' mom, his earthly mother, as he was crucified. And Jesus speaks to him from the cross. And so you can imagine the emotions involved here. And Mary, who's been caring for the body, and it says, we do not know. So there were others with her. And so they don't know where the body's gone. Now, understand in your 2023 brain, whether you know the whole story or not, understand she has no categories for what has happened. See, there's a category for there's a body dead in a tomb. We understand that. There's a category for a body missing. But there's no real categories for Jesus being alive at this point. And so Mary's heart is broken John and Peter go running, and they find an empty tomb. And again, what I want to do is I want to follow along with their responses and their reactions and see if we can't connect with some of them. So verse 5, it says, And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but did not go in. That's Peter. Verse 6, Then Simon Peter came following... Oh, that was John, excuse me. Verse 6, Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. So Peter and John reach the tomb. The stone is moved away. Peter looks into the tomb and finds no body, but goes no further. Now, a little bit about Peter. Last we left off, Peter had been denying Jesus and had felt the shame of denying him three times that night. 
And so Peter is in a very unique place. He's in that place where many of us have been if we've lost someone we've loved, and we just wish we had done something different before that, right? We've all experienced that, or most of us have experienced that. And I would say it's a common human thing. You will experience that at some point, I'm sure. I wish I had said this. I wish I had not said this. And that's where Peter is. And John looks in, and John sees the clothes that Jesus was buried in, the things that would kind of keep him together and, and, and keep the embalming and the, the things together, sees them separate in the face cloth lying folded apart. Verse 8, and it says, Then the other disciple would reach the tomb first. I love that he keeps bringing that up. Also went in, and John saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So we have the first response, John believes. So John, the author of our gospel, John, the beloved disciple, John who writes this gospel and the three letters that bear his name and the book of Revelation, the book we've been studying on Sundays. We just took a break for Easter. He is the one who has been a close disciple of Jesus. He's been there through a lot of things with him. He's been there more even than the rest of the twelve. That Peter, James, and John have been that inside circle. And Peter's wandered away in shame. And John has been there by the cross, the only one to remain there as all this takes place. And as he reaches the tomb, he looks in, he sees no body. And the clothes lying there, and it says he believes. And it says that at that moment, the things that Jesus had said and the things that scriptures had been written about began to make more sense. And see, John gives us this inside story. He's one who is there firsthand. He was there through all the teachings of Jesus. He's Jewish and very familiar with the Old Testament scriptures that proclaim a Messiah. Passages like Isaiah 52 and 53 that say that the Messiah will die and, and, and paints a, por a, a portrayal, if you will, of the crucifixion and that he will raise again to life. Again, things written hundreds of years before Jesus comes and fulfills them as God's promise so that we would know what to look for, that we would know that this is the answer. But when you're alive and you're, you're walking with Jesus, it doesn't make sense. Again, if Jesus looks at you and says, listen, I've got to die, but I'll be back in three days. Again, we don't have a category for that. We don't have a framework to think about that. That just makes no sense. So aren't you, you just assume now he must mean something else. Because we don't understand that. But at this moment with an empty tomb, now John begins to believe. He hasn't seen Jesus. It's just things start to click and John believes. This resurrection piece of the gospel is critical to the story. So let's back up to where we've been. That there's a God who loves us, who created us, designed us, and that sin has separated us from a holy God, and that God has now sent Christ, his son, who is fully God and yet fully man, who was creator in the beginning, and yet who is also fully human. A mystery, a, a, a paradox. And Jesus enters into human history, and he lives the life that we're called to. He dies a death in our place. He becomes a substitution for us. That any who would like to be in Christ can be, and their sins can be forgiven. But I want to, we pause there for a minute. I just want you to imagine for a second that you are, that if we could, we just confessed all these things that we are, all the things that we have done, the things that we don't want anybody to know. My life is pretty on display. My past is pretty on display. People know I've written about it in the book I published. I mean, like, it's out, the story's out there. But we all know there are things inside that we don't want anybody to know. The things we hold back. The things that we're just ashamed that that's how we think or feel or act or do. Imagine we confessed all those things and just imagine the mountain of sin that each one of us could confess to. Now forgiveness is saying, hey listen, you are this. Like that's you. But I don't hold it against you still defined by it. See, the resurrection is that's taken away and you are given new life. See, there's power in the resurrection. John begins to understand that Jesus couldn't just die. That when he died, he forgave our sin. He said, I don't hold this against you. 
but it still defines you. But the resurrection says, I'm redefining you. That I, in my new life, give you new life. And the words that Jesus taught, like you must be born again, begin to make more sense. That newness of life comes through the resurrection. The very first promise of Jesus to come exists way back in the garden when sin first enters into human history. The first human beings ever. And God proclaims this. He says that the seed of a woman will come and have victory over Satan and sin and death. And at this moment, those promises of victory are starting to become clear for John. So I think of this verse in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That death can't define us. That death doesn't have the last word. Some of you here today may be fearful of death. I know many are. But the hope is that in Christ, the hope that we have, the assurance we have, is that in Christ, physical death is not the last thing. 1 Corinthians also says, it is appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. And that when you stand there, you either stand in Christ or apart from Christ. If you are living for Jesus today, you stand in Christ. And he says, not only have I taken all this away, but I've given you new life. Apart from Christ, you're defined by that. But in Christ, we have great hope and new life. The resurrection is new life. Verse 11, it says, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stopped to look in the tomb. So just remember, no one has seen Jesus yet. There's been an empty tomb and a rock rolled away. A large stone that covered the entrance of the tomb. A tomb you could walk people into, not just lay a body in. And so this this scene has taken place, and she was the first to see it, but she doesn't understand. John is the first to believe. He believes by faith. He begins to understand the things that Jesus said, and the things that Scripture had said for thousands of years, had promised long in advance that Jesus proclaimed to fulfill, but again, the minds just couldn't wrap around. Those that were standing there just couldn't, how is he going to die and return? Like, I don't get it. But John believes by faith. Mary is still processing this. They've taken my Lord, she says. Says she wept, and she, as she stooped to look in, as she peers in, there's no Jesus. And what she is is sad. Her heart is broken for this moment. So John believes, Mary weeps, Peter still doesn't believe. Verse 12, and she, meaning Mary, saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and then one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to him, they have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? I love this line, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, she said to him, sir, you have carried him away. If you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. This garden tomb that Jesus has been placed in by a quiet disciple that had followed him and asked for the body upon his death, and quietly put him in a tomb, has set him in this tomb, in this place, in a garden that was meant to be for him and his family, but Jesus needed a place to be laid before Passover. And so Mary is going to this garden tomb, to this place where this family owes to care for a body, and the body's gone. She sees angels, but she doesn't get that. She turns to talk to Jesus and doesn't understand. And again, you've kind of got to be her for a minute And just say, okay, listen, you just don't have a way of thinking that allows you to think that's him. And then he speaks her name. And her eyes are, if you will, opened. And she says, teacher, there you are. And Mary believes. So we have these reactions. We we hear the story, okay, Jesus is going to be resurrected. He's going to die and he's going to return in three days. Jesus, as he pivoted towards Jerusalem... A week, 
two weeks prior to his entrance into Jerusalem, begins to ramp up the teaching about that. That he focuses in on his death and his resurrection. That he will return from the grave. But again, you have to be there in the moment and understand like that doesn't make sense. And so they continued on. And then when they see an empty grave, sometimes it still doesn't make sense. And Peter is still defined by his denial and shame. And then people are now starting to understand. One by faith, one by sight. As Jesus speaks her name, people are beginning to see and believe in the resurrected Jesus. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I, as, I am ascended to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Jesus sends Mary to the other disciples. She'll be the first one to share her faith. I've seen the living Jesus. He spoke my name. I saw him. He sent me to you. There are many that will say Christianity represses women. Maybe you go to a church, but this church is, is one of them where you have male elders and pastors. We, we think that, that men are uniquely called to lead in the homes and lead in the church. It's limited to just one thing, to being dads and husbands and in the church to being pastors or elders. But we believe that women are gifted and loved and needed and cherished and the first one to go share their faith is a woman. The first one to see Jesus alive is a woman. And she's sent to go tell the disciples 2,000 years ago when women couldn't even testify in court. And she's the first one to say, I saw him. She's the first one sent. And she gets to go say, I saw him. Verse 19, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So the disciples so far, we've got Mary and John who believe. We've got Peter who has all but left the disciples out of shame for his denial. He goes back to fishing. We'll see him in just a minute. But now Jesus appears where the disciples are gathering. And listen to where they are. They're in a room locked for fear of the Jews, right? They, they don't believe yet that Jesus is alive, and they're thinking maybe they took the body, and they're persecuting Christians for sure. They just arrested and then killed Jesus, and so they're fearful of the religious elite that killed Jesus. And so they're in a locked room, and Jesus shows up. That's a moment, right? That's something you don't experience all the time. And he speaks to them. He shows them his hands. He the piercing in the side, and they needed a little more proof. They'd heard already, they had not yet believed. Then Jesus appears, and there's more proof now. Maybe you're beginning to find yourself in the story. Maybe, maybe you've run away. Maybe, maybe you've believed by faith. Maybe you believe when you see, or when, when God has spoken and opened up your heart. Maybe, maybe you're looking for a little more proof. Maybe there's something that, something that holds you back. Well, now more people are coming to faith as Jesus reveals himself there. What have you heard about Jesus and Christianity? Now, there's a mixed message out there today, and there's a mixed message because Christianity is giving a mixed message today. Some is very justice-minded and, and culturally engaged and some is very something else, I, I don't know. And some, it just the gospel and Christianity right now in America is just all over the place. Some is hyper-political. But here's what we see as a group of people that have been transformed by a living Jesus. We don't see any groups or missions or messages yet. We just see people that are being transformed by a living Jesus. Now here comes a bit of the message, verse 21 Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so even, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. First, life in the gospel should be a life of peace, not chaos. That Jesus gives peace in 
In crazy circumstances in the life that we live, inner peace is a marking of the true follower of Jesus. Right, that we know things are okay even when things are not okay. Second, we're a sent people. We're a people that are sent back into the world we live with that message of peace, with the message that, that Jesus has given us. In fact, that with the message of forgiveness, which is the next thing. He tells him, listen, when you forgive sin, you forgive sin. When you withhold sin, and he's not talking about you, the individual, not looking for a priest to absolve sin, He's saying you, the collection, the community of faith, the church, you proclaim the gospel. You're sent back to proclaim the gospel, the message that reconciles a holy God with sinful humanity. You're in charge of the message. But I love that he breathes on them. He says, be filled with my spirit. He doesn't expect the church to go and, and live out that message and share that message in their own strength. Remember, the collection of things that we are that we don't need to be defined by anymore, but imagine like this is our best efforts. But Jesus says, let me give you my spirit. The spirit that raises Jesus from the dead lives inside of the believer. That's the very promise of baptism, that you would be filled, empowered, living in the, in the Holy Spirit, that you would be empowered to live for Jesus in this world. And so Jesus gives them this. There's this message of new life. Again, the resurrection message is critical because we are no longer defined by our worst decisions. Instead, we are defined by Christ's best decisions. Amen. Many have known me for a long time. My family and my parents are here. I mean, I, they've known me for a long time, I hear. I... <laughs> to know me is to know somebody changed. Not changed by me. I couldn't change me. To see this life as a life that is empowered by something else. Because my best efforts got me into a lot of trouble. A lot of darkness, a lot of pain. I caused a lot of pain. I endured a lot of pain. But we're given new life in the gospel. We're no longer defined by who we were. We are defined by Christ. Romans 6 says this, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? In other words, we die, our flesh, our past dies with Jesus. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptized into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. That in Christ there is new life, that you walk as a new person, that you are made new. You are not just saved from, you are made to be. Right? That there is a transformation that takes place in Christ. And sometimes things happen quickly, and sometimes things are a process. It just is, but God begins to do a work in the follower of Jesus. Verse 24 says this, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side... I will never believe. Pretty strong statement, right? All your buddies have, saw, have seen something. I will never believe unless, right? But Thomas, doubting Thomas, right? We've all heard that. He doubts the message. And notice what the disciples are doing. Now, they're living out what Jesus has called them to do. They're, they're going back and they're proclaiming a living Jesus, that Jesus is alive today. The very same message we proclaim here, that Jesus not just rose from the dead, but is alive today. That he is the one who receives our worship and answers our prayers and empowers our lives by his spirit, by the work that he accomplished both on the cross and in the resurrection. That Jesus changes lives. And so they give this message to Thomas who doubts them and just says, listen, i got to see for myself and maybe you find yourself there. Maybe you easily believe or, or maybe there's a moment where, where Jesus speaks to you and you believe or maybe it takes a little more proof or maybe you're just like, unless I get this, I will not believe. Well, watch what happens. Verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Listen, blessed are those 
who have not seen and yet believed. Blessed is the one who believes by faith. I'll give you one blessing. Here's what Thomas has missed out on the last eight days. In those eight days, he was in a different place than those around him. Not may not seem like a long time, but maybe with you it's eight years or 80 years. What do we miss out on when we fail to give our life and, and believe in and trust in Jesus for every breath we take? So we miss out on are those things that he gives. He, he gives peace even when circumstances around us don't give peace. They bring chaos, but we have peace. He gives forgiveness. He not only gives forgiveness, but he removes that. He removes that sin and shame that we don't have to be defined by who we were. He gives us a mission to join in and a family, the church, to be a part of. That we here are a family of families. And that Jesus has given us this to live this life in. That we love our biological families. And they are absolutely a gift from God. Mine is a gift from God. But we love our church family too. And I will say this again, mine also. My church family is a gift from God too. And so we miss out when we wait and dig in and say, unless God does this, I won't believe. you are just pushing you off. So Jesus appears to Thomas and does exactly what he said. He said, if I can see his hand, touch his hand. So Jesus calls him to that. But he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in his name. He said, John says this, and he said this, if you were here on Friday night... He said, here's why I write this, that you will believe. He says, I'm an eyewitness to this. I'm putting my name on it. I saw this. You can believe in this. And he says it again. This is written. There's so much more, John says, I could have written. But this is written that you might believe. And this doesn't just mean this mental assent to something might be true. But belief transforms behavior. If we believe the fire is hot, we will act differently. We can just hear fire's hot, and we can believe it, and then we'll get burned. Belief changes action. We say here that we don't have behavior problems, we have belief problems, because belief changes behavior. If you believe that Jesus is who he said he is, that he was the creator who created the universe, that he entered human flesh and became fully human while remaining fully God, however that works, and lived a sinless life, and then died a substitutionary death, and was laid in a tomb for three days, and then was seen over a dozen different appearances over 40 days, alive by hundreds of people. If you truly believe that, if you truly believe he is alive today, it will change how you live. You will no longer live for you. You will live for him. That you will wake up each morning wanting to put him in charge of the day. John 21, there's one more noteworthy response. Of course, we've been waiting for Peter, so we're going to look at it quickly. Verse 1, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into a boat, and that night they caught nothing. So they go back to fishing. If you're familiar with the disciples, they start out as fishermen. Jesus calls them to leave fishing and to become fishers of men. He tells them, he says, I'm going to teach you about me. You're going to go tell, share me with others. You're going to tell others about me. And you'll capture men for the gospel into the kingdom. But Peter has left. After denying Jesus three times and then hearing that rooster crow in the background as Jesus said it would happen, he's just ashamed of who he'd become. And so instead of leaning in, he runs away. Instead of pressing into Jesus, which is the right answer, he runs the other direction. So he goes back to his old life. And that's what happens when we allow things to get in between us and God. It drives us back to where we were, who we were. 
Verse 4 says, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, and yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. This is full-time professional fishermen who have caught nothing. Oh, just use the other side of the boat. It's awesome. So they cast it, and now they were able to, not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. I love that they do it anyways, like we got nothing, right? Let's try it. Sounds crazy. Let's try it. Such a great catch that they can't even barely haul it in. Verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved, again John, referring to himself, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. You know, when I hear this, when I see this verse, I always think of John like, I beat you to the tomb, and I was right. <laughs> right? There he is. The disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. So this story reads, and you can read it any way you want to, I picture Peter in some board shorts fishing, and John says, I told you so. Maybe he didn't, but in my sarcastic life, that's what he did, all right? And Peter, seeing this, doesn't throw himself towards Jesus. He doesn't throw himself towards the land. He throws himself towards the sea. And then the other guys just take the boat and go in. Well, Peter's got to come in eventually, right? There goes Peter. He's not going to make it, right? So as he works his way back in, he just can't get away from Jesus, Right? He wants to because he's denied him. He's ashamed of who he's become, but he, he just can't seem to get away from him. And, and he still hangs out with the disciples, but he's no longer really living that way. He's gone back to his old life. And then he sees Jesus, and the miracle should have clued him in, but John made sure to tell him. And he just goes swimming. Peter feels unredeemable because of what he's done. You know, as a pastor, I sit with a lot of people, and I, I hear a lot about lives that, uh, the, the lives that the people are living. It is not the worst people that have done the worst things that feel unredeemable. Some, uh, not always. Sometimes there's just this one thing that someone will hang on to. And most of them would be like, really, that's the, that's the thing you think is unredeemable? Yet sometimes sin plagues us so deeply that we just don't understand, we don't, we don't believe that Jesus could welcome us back in. And that's Peter. But you got to come in out of the water eventually. Verse 9, so when they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? <laughs> they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the, you know, on that, you've just still got to put yourself in their shoes. You don't have a category, somebody who is dead and is not anymore. And they know it's him, but they're still wrestling with the reality of this. Verse 12, we'll back up. To, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Verse 13, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so were the fish. Now, this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Again, there's these 12 moments in Scripture that we see these appearances after the tomb. And this is just the third time that Jesus has revealed himself to the disciples. And this really is not about the disciples so much as it's about Peter. It's about the one who's been running the other direction. Verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? This is a callback to when Peter, before he denied him, says, I love you most. I will die alongside you. I will do anything for you. I will fight for you. I will die for you. I will never leave you. But see, Peter is caught up in who he is and the strength of who Peter believes himself to be, not who Peter is in the gospel. And Jesus looks at him and says, tonight you'll betray me three times. 
before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. One of the times is to a little servant girl who really poses no threat. Because Peter in his own strength isn't all that. This story is all about the pursuit of the one. This is about the pursuit of Peter who ran away. Right? We have that those stories in Luke 15. It says, now who among you who has 100 sheep would not leave the 99 to go get the one that ran away? And when you go find the one who runs away, you carry him back and, and you love him and you tell everybody, I found him, I found him, I've got him, and you celebrate. And Jesus says, just so. That all of heaven rejoices when one sinner returns. Then when 99 persons who need no repentance, it is more joyful to see the one come to faith, to the one be forgiven, to the one be redeemed, to the one be reconciled to God, than it is for 99 who just stay in place. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's pursuing the one that walked away. The one because of his own sin and shame and decisions has been driven away and is just going back to the life he knew before Jesus. Verse 15 says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to him, Simon Peter, Simon son of John, do you love me more than these? Now here's Peter's answer. He said to him, well, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Just as Peter denied Jesus three times, Jesus goes and calls him back three times. But see, we could hear this and we could, we could respond in, in, in a kind of that warm feeling of, oh, listen, look, Jesus goes and pursues Peter who wandered away. And that's true. We can celebrate that he says, yes, I love you, but I want you to see the greater picture here. You see, the crucifixion, again, covers sin. The resurrection gives new life. Without a resurrection, our preaching is in, our, in vain, and we could have done anything other than this today. But here's what happens. He doesn't just forgive him. He sets him on a mission. Feed my lambs, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. He sets him in place to go back to where he was to go do ministry for Peter to become the Peter we know of. He doesn't just forgive him. He calls him to get back in the game, to get back into ministry, to get back in the care of other people. As Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And if you're in Christ today, you, you are a part of his flock, his family. But the metaphor has always been this flock. And so Jesus calls Peter not just to be forgiven, but be empowered, be different, live a new life. Not let this define you, be defined by Christ. And so he says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. He says, listen, come back, care for the people I care for. You see, it's not just about being a forgiven version of your broken self. It's about being a transformed version of who Jesus is creating you to be. Same Peter. If you just follow the story out in a few pages, as the birth of the church, we see this church gathered. It's about this size. They're gathered in a room. And the Spirit falls on them in a unique way, empowering them. With the surrounding people here, what the crowds outside all hear is them proclaiming the goodness of God, but they hear them proclaiming that in a language that they speak, in a language they hear, in a language they know. They hear the gospel being proclaimed. And they begin to wonder what's going on in there. And what happens is Peter goes outside. Now, let's just push, push pause for a second. See, we're in Jerusalem around the feasts. And the crowds that gather are the crowds that just called for the death of Jesus. And the crowds are there. The ones that shouted for Jesus' death are there. The Jewish religious elite in Jerusalem who wanted Jesus dead for, to regain their kind of political power, their influence in Judaism, they're all still there. The danger is still there. The people that want you dead are still there. And Peter, who had denied Jesus three times, and again, one time to a little girl. Not just men with swords or with 
abilities to take you, but he just denied Jesus. Walks back out to that same crowd, to that same Jerusalem, and preaches one of the most pointed gospels in all of Scripture. And it culminates in this message. This Jesus whom you crucified, God raised from the dead. Like you're on the wrong side of God. Because you crucified him and God raised him from the dead. That's who Peter becomes. And that crowd who had chanted for his death, who saw him crucified, they asked this question, what must we do to be saved? Acts 2.38, such a great answer. 37 and 38, we have both. It says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. You too will be transformed. You you too will be empowered to live the life that Christ has called you to. And so friends, I say this today on Easter. If you are visiting here, if someone invited you, and maybe you don't go to church, hear the gospel message of not just forgiveness. Notice not once we've talked about forever, we've talked about today. That Jesus calls us to be made new. That the cross forgives, but the resurrection gives new life. That Jesus provides answers for where you are today. Where I spent eternity never fazed me. Getting through life today always is what drove me. Jesus wants to walk with you today. So who are you in the story? Are you the one that already believes, just knows, like, okay, I'm just starting, it's it's all coming together. Are you the one who who had to kind of look and see and, and, okay, see Jesus and hear a word and like, okay, now I I know. But you don't believe, maybe you're the one who hasn't, you've heard from others, but you don't really believe. And I mean, believe at the level of changing everything in your life, that if if Jesus says this, then it's this. But then he shows more proof. Maybe you doubt even that and you're waiting for some sign. I pray that you get that. Maybe you're the one here, though, who's wandered so far away, you don't think there's any hope left. And if that's you, Peter is the story for you. That there are hope for all. That there is hope for all. That no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, and trust me, the people in this room, we've fulfilled that whole list of what not to do's. Starting with me. Jesus will forgive. Jesus will redeem. Jesus will restore. And Jesus will renew and give you a new life. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we love you. We thank you that this day is about you being alive, that you're alive today, as alive as I am. You are alive today. In fact, more. You have overcome this broken body, you have overcome this world. You've overcome Satan, sin, and death. You are alive forever. All of us must still die once. But your call to us today is that we may live with you forever. Better than that, we can live with you today in this crazy world. We can even be a part of the comfort and peace in this world to others. Jesus, you have overcome everything, are alive today. You hear our prayers, you answer our prayers. You receive our worship. You are glorified by your church. I pray for those here today, maybe hearing the gospel for the first time, maybe hearing it for the who knows how many times, but hearing it in a different way. I pray that they would hear the words of a transformed disciple who says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, that you might be forgiven and receive the Spirit of God. May we all be transformed by your spirit. May we live a new life because you live in us. Jesus, today, we get to glorify. We we say this same message every week. But today is a unique time to hold you high and celebrate you're alive. May we hear that with new ears today, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.